during the series that we had on, on Hanukkah up until now, we mentioned the idea of the difference between seven and eight. Maharal speaks about this at great length. At seven is the number that characterizes our world, the world that we are in, the environment that we are we're living in. He even speaks of the seven days of creation. You're, of course, all familiar with the uh, phrase the six days of creation. He mentions the seven days of creation because, although, strictly speaking, there wasn't a new creation on the seventh day, but the seventh day is the purpose of the first six days, and it makes the unit of the week, and we live in terms of the unit of the week. So it's seven that characterizes our, um, our world. And eight, the number eight, indicates something that's beyond our world, which is above and beyond the natural world in which we live. Um, and what I want to show you, uh, I showed this already, and I'm going to repeat it with the, with the Hanukkah Lech. What I want to show you is that when the Torah has an eight, and it does indicate something beyond the natural world, it isn't a pure eight. Eight is always seven plus one. And that means that when you think of the contrast between the natural and the supernatural, there are two different ways to think about the supernatural. One is just, it's another realm. Don't think that the so-called natural realm exhausts everything. No, it doesn't exhaust everything. There are other things that are beyond it. And that's eight. That's one way to think about it. There's another way to think about it, and that is we're not considering the supernatural realm in and of itself so that you have apples over here and tortillas over there, and they're two separate things, and uh, they're two separate subjects. No, we're not going that high. We're talking about nature, and then we're talking about how that which is beyond nature affects nature. How that which is beyond nature inserts itself into nature and has an effect on nature. But not the supernatural is uh, 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 beyond. And that's why I think it's important to appreciate that the eights in the Torah are really seven plus one, not a pure eight. It's the seven plus one that goes beyond, but that one adds to the seven and creates something in our world, but something of a different character in our world. That's what I want to show you. Now, we spoke about this in the, in the uh, Hanukkah Lecht. Of course, what I told you is one out of, let's say, 462 options of how to explain these things. But it is one, and it's, it's, um, I think it's an essential one. And that is that the Beis Yosef asked the question that since you found one night's worth of oil and it burned for eight nights, that gives a net miracle of seven nights. So why do we, so to speak, celebrate the miracle for eight nights? And then, I think even worse than that, the Rambam says that they went into the temple on the 25th of Kislev, cleaned it out, set up a menorah, and lit the menorah. Well, when do you light the menorah? At night. So the date on which they lit the menorah at the times of the Maccabees was the 26th of Kislev, the next day. The date changes in the evening, right? So it's the 26th. So why do we start celebrating the miracle by lighting on the night of the 25th? We're a day early. So the answer to both of those questions, if I remember correctly, it said in the name of the Prima Godim, <coughs> is that the first night celebrates the military victory. That's why it's a day early, because that's the day in which at least the military forces took control of Jerusalem and were able to clean out the temple. And then the next seven nights, starting on the 26th, are a celebration of the seven miraculous increases of the burning power of the oil above and beyond the first night. So that means that the eight nights of Hanukkah are really seven plus one. Seven to celebrate the miracle of the oil, plus one for the, for, for the 
um, military victory. And then I told you, this also is, this also is my route, that a large purpose, if not the purpose, he seems to say the purpose, uh, at least a very large purpose of the miracle of the oil was to enable you to see that the military victory was a divine providence and not just blind nature. <clears throat> so the way in which you get beyond the natural here is in a sense very profound. It's that the beyond the natural is operating in the natural world all the time, which means that what you call the natural world isn't just natural. It's, ex it's an expression of the beyond the natural. And that's what I wanted to explain to you that is true typically of eights in the Torah uh, across the board. You have a question? Is there a reason given why it's seven and eight? Or is it just that now that we see within Chumash or whatever that seven is the number <coughs> of Teva and eight beyond that we then explain? I'm not quite, quite, I mean, quite sure. It could have been four days. <coughs> Wait a minute. That What's the it? You mean Hanukkah? Or nature versus beyond nature. Well, the first chapter of Genesis plus the first three verses of the second chapter describe the creation of the world. So since the creation of the world, that's the... the that's clear. As, 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 as the Maral calls it, the seven days of creation. Right? So that definitely is the creation of our world. Now, the question is, it's a creation so obviously there's a creator who's beyond. He's creating this. But the activity of creating this was an activity of seven days. So the seven days is stamped into this thing that he created. Point is that it doesn't, it doesn't exist on its own. It doesn't, it doesn't exist independently. And it, it, not only is it dependent, but sometimes there are things in this world which are directly produced by the beyond. Usually that's Miracles, that's what the standard uh, texts say. And here, then Hanukkah goes even a step further that to what looks natural also is an expression of that. But, but, but again, like I said at the very beginning, what are we looking for? Are we looking at the supernatural as another subject? No. We're looking at the supernatural as a thing which has an effect on the first subject, has an effect on the natural world, and it's that relationship that we're studying, not something that goes beyond. There is a beyond. And there are other things to study. I'm just saying the eights, the eights that represent the supernatural express the idea that in the seven there's an addition of something else into the seven and therefore expresses itself in the seven. Not something that's totally dis distinct and separate. Yeah? Oh, I'm coming to that. That's my next example. That's my next example. Can I ask a question? Let's look at it. Look on page in, in the on the Chumash, let's Look on page six eighty nine. Here I show you how you sort of have to be, how shall I say, awake, alert, and inquisitive and critical to be able to read things. Here's something which we read so often, it's hard to even hear that there's a question, but there is a question. Um, let's say let's start with verse thirty nine. So this is now the introduction of the holiday of Sukkot. Parashas Emor, this is Leviticus chapter 23. But on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you gather in the crop of the land, you shall celebrate Hashem's festival for a seven-day period. The first day is a rest day, and the eighth day is a rest day. Are the alarm bells ringing? Yes. Where? Why? Eighth day. What do you mean? What's, what's the alarm? Yeah, I mean, it's a seven-day festival. There isn't an eighth day. Eight out of what? Eight out of seven? Give me a break. That makes no, it doesn't read. If anybody write that for an English story, the editor would immediately say, what are you talking about? Can't say seven days or the eighth day. Well, you ought to register that. That's right, you can't say that. It means that after the seven days there's a day, which in some respects is something new, and is also, in some respects, somehow, the culmination of the previous, so it could be called eighth. Now, on the second seven days of Sukkot, you live in a Sukkah. On the eighth day, you don't. On the seven days of Sukkot, you take the little of an Esrog. On the eighth day, you don't. On the seven days of Sukkot, there's a certain order to the sacrifices, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7. 
And the eighth day isn't six, it's one. So, so as the Gemara calls it, the eighth day is regular Bifnei Atzmo. But, for example, you're supposed to appear in the temple on, in this holiday period, and if you only appear on the eighth day, you've satisfied it. How could that be? You're supposed to come on Sukkot, right? Well, sort of. You're supposed to come on Sukkot plus. Sukkot plus eight. And uh, if you came on the eight, you came on Sukkot plus eight. So it, it, isn't, it isn't entirely separate. It's largely separate, but not entirely separate. And, according to the Arizal, it carries a certain character, which is shared by something else that we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, and that is that, unlike all other holidays, the eighth day of Sukkot has no mitzvot for the individual to do. The only way that you would know it's a holiday at all is, number one, there's a prohibition against doing the kinds of work that can't be done on holidays. And number two, there's a special <coughs> sacrifice in the temple. But for the individual, if he's living in Cincinnati and he's uh, sitting at home, there's nothing he does which expresses the fact that it's a yamtu, unlike all the other holidays except for Shavuot, which was coming up. So it has a separate character. And I'm going to show you the same thing with respect to Shavuos, and then I'll explain both of them together. It's also here at Emor. Um, yeah, take a look on page 685. Uh, this is chapter 23, still verse 15. This is counting Sphira, counting the, the days between the second day of Pesach and Shavuos. Now here again, pay attention and see if, see if you get to yourselves what's, uh, what's difficult here. You shall count for yourselves from the morrow of the rest day, whatever that is, the day after the rest day, from the day when you bring the omer, the waving, I'm not going to work on that, seven weeks. You should count for yourself seven, self, seven weeks. They shall be complete <coughs> until the morrow of the seventh week shall you count 50 days. Got it? Which flag are you waving now? For the moral. Oh, before you get to that. Maybe you understand, maybe you don't. Well, before that, what's right on the, right on the, on the surface that needs, needs help? Help! Uh, how, are, how much time are you counting? Seven weeks. Seven weeks. No, last time you did, you did arithmetic. Right? Seven times seven was? 49. 49. So what do you mean 50 days? Seven weeks, 50 days? You know, that's a little odd, right? But now, if you're starting to say this, but you, might, you may have heard from this from me two or three times before, um, it's even worse than that, because it says, seven weeks, they shall be complete until the morrow of the seventh day shall you count. Leave out the 50 days. So let's see, suppose you start counting on Tuesday. Tuesday is 1, next Tuesday is 8, next Tuesday is 15. Go down 7 weeks, the next final Tuesday is, the final Monday is 49. Right? The morrow of the end of the 7th week is the 8th Tuesday. Right? Okay. You're counting 7 weeks until the morrow. Okay, so it's Tuesday to Monday, Tuesday to Monday, Tuesday to Monday, Tuesday to Monday, Tuesday to Monday. Until the eighth Tuesday. Now, in English and in Hebrew, the word until is ambiguous. When you say <coughs> until Q, it could mean up to Q, but not including Q. Or it could mean up to and including Q. Cook until well done. That means you only stop after it's well done. Uh, you're eligible up until your 60th birthday. On your 60th birthday, are you eligible or not? No, no you are not. So until is ambiguous. In Hebrew, we say ad, it can be ad ba ad bechal, or ad ve ad bechal. Do you include the thing it says ad or not? So here it says seven weeks until the day after the seven weeks. How shall we explain the until? To include the thing after or to exclude the thing after? If you tell me that it includes, so you got 
Tuesday to Monday, Tuesday to Monday, Tuesday to Monday, seven times. Then you got that final eighth Tuesday, and you tell me the until includes the eighth Tuesday. Then you've already got 50 days before it says 50 days. And if you tell me it says until, but not include, don't include the final t- Tuesday, the eighth Tuesday, then, of course, if you count 49, then what you're counting is up to 50 and not counting 50. That's what really counting 49 means. So, so like, <laughs> what does it tell you? It tells you nothing. That's before it says 50. So Rashi explains something very deep here. Rashi says, it means until but not including. And what it means is this. When you're counting, um, this is my Taichi <coughs> Rashi. When you're counting, 16, 27, 32. 16 out of what? 16 out of 49 or 16 out of 50? Is that eighth Tuesday, is that just the day after counting? You know, there are lots of mitzvahs in the Torah. And they come in order. It's a calendar. Now, let's see. We count these, these 49 days. What comes after that? Sukkot? No, no, no. Yom Kippur comes before that. And, and Rosh Hashanah comes before that. Okay, okay. So I'm counting the 49 days. What comes next? Oh, there's another one. Shibuiz. That comes after also. Is that right? Just after. There are lots of things there. It's the first thing after the 49. Or no. When you're counting 16 and 27 and 32, it's 16 out of 50. Because there's a 50-day unit, and that 50-day unit breaks up into 49 you count and one you don't count. But it's not 49 and then something else. It's 49, it's a 50-day unit, 49 of which you count, and 50 which, which you don't count, the 50 if you don't count. And that's when it says 50 days, it means like this, according to <coughs> Russia. You're counting seven weeks up till and not including the day after the seventh week. And the result of counting four, seven weeks up to and not including the day after the four, seven weeks, the result is 50 days. Because the 50 days form a unit. So it's the 50th day of a 50-day period. That means it's exactly parallel to Shemini Atzeres. Because Shemini Atzeres, you say you have seven days, and there's an eighth day. And we said, eight out of what? No. There's seven days of something, and then there's a day after, which counts as the eighth day of this period. So you have it exactly parallel here. Now, the Arizal says that these two days have something crucial in common, and that is that neither one has a, a mitzvah for the yachid, for the individual. Shavuos also has no mitzvah for the individual. It's only prohibition against work, plus a special offering in the, in the temple, but nothing for the individual to do. And that's because, the Arizal says, that spiritual creativity has a certain rhythm. There's active creativity of the individual to bring himself to a new spiritual condition, but if it's only his activity, when he stops, it will naturally dissipate. There's nothing that's holding it back from dissipating. The only thing that can make it permanent is if he releases it to a Kodesh Baruch Hu, and a Kodesh Baruch Hu stamps it from his side with his permanence. What a person does by, its, by his own uh, it, it devices is something which will, will, will naturally dissipate. So there's activity and passivity, and he brings two this is, I'm talking Shem Shmuel now, brings two, two proofs for this. I'm sure there are many that I don't know. But there, he brings two proofs to this. One is that when you come to present yourself in the temple in Jerusalem on the, on the pilgrimage festivals, on Pesach, Shavuos, and, and Sukkot, there's a mitzvah that if you come and it's Tuesday, sleep overnight in Yerushalayim. Don't go home the same day. Even if you live nearby and you could go home, don't do that. Stay overnight. Because coming and presenting yourself in the Yazara is an active spiritual step up, and it'll only become permanent if you give it back to a Kodesh Baruch and say, I'm giving it to you, I'm relinquishing control. And the original of, of this idea is Jacob. Jacob leaves his home. He's told by his parents to go and get married. And he makes this brief stopover of 14 years in the yeshiva Shem Ve'ever. And Chazal tell us that he didn't sleep those 14 years. 
Then he goes to live with Lovan, and he testifies after 20 years with Lovan, I didn't sleep. My sleep fled from my eyes in the daytime, in the nighttime. So he's got 14 years in yeshiva without sleeping. 20 years by Lovan without, without sleeping. And in between, in between, goes to sleep and has the dream of the ladder and the angels going up and down and so forth and so on. So, the Shem Yishmuel asks the quintessential Jewish question, why did he do that? Why did he go to sleep? He didn't have enough to chaza for 14, after 14 years in, in, in yeshiva? He could have you know, worked on the Rebbe Kibagers? Why did he go to sleep? And the answer says the Shem Yishmuel is because he achieved something in yeshiva. He's going to a different context. He can't work on that anymore. Not there. There he's got to work on something else. What is going to make what he achieved in yeshiva permanent? Only relinquishing control. Wow. Giving up control. Like sleeping over in Yerushalayim, so he went to sleep in order because Baruch Hu should seal it. So that's why these two days, Shemini Yatzeris on the one hand and, and Shuvah on the other hand, have no missus for the individual because we have to give up control. What we did in counting the 49 days is sealed by the 50th day where we don't count. What we did on Sukkot um, is sealed by Shmini Yatzeris. And I think the capstone on this whole argument <coughs> is a medrash. The medrash says that Shmini Yatzeris should really have been 50 days after the first day of Sukkot, just like uh, Shavuos is 50 days after the first day of, the second day of, of, of Pesach. There should have been a 50-day period here and a 50-day period there, which would mean that there are two parallel holiday seasons, each 50 days long, each one with a full holiday at the beginning, plus six more semi-holidays, and a final holiday at the end. That's what it should have been. That's what the measure says. It doesn't say why it isn't so. I've heard the explanation that if you have to make a lila regal, if you have to present yourself in the Torah, in the Beis HaMikdash, to make a lila regal in the wintertime when Eretz Yisrael is mud is very difficult. That's one reason why it wasn't done. Or maybe I'm sure there are other reasons that I don't know. At any rate, the, the parallel between Shemini Yatzeris on the one hand and, and Shavuos is, 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 is exact. And as a matter of fact, the rabbinic name for, for Shavuos is Atzeris. They took that name for it. So what you see here is that these two are, are the culminations of a period. They have a spiritual function vis-a-vis -vis the period. Now, these are, in the, in, in the case of, of Shavuos, the way, the way it is, uh, Sukkot, the way it is, it's seven plus one, which is eight. And here it's seven sevens plus one, which is a grand eight, right? And what are they both about? They're both about inviting the Kodesh Baruch Hu to take what we accomplished by our efforts and make it permanent. That's something beyond the seven, something beyond this world. But that beyond this world is a separate subject of investigation. What is it going to do in this world? What effect is it going to have in this world? The effect is that it's going to make the, what we accomplished in this worldly effort permanent. So again, these eights are seven plus one. Are we together? Okay. Now let's try another one. <coughs> uh, I'm, I'm warning you that this is a trick question. To see if you pick up where, where the problem is. How old is a, bo is a boy when he has his bris milah? Eight days. Eight days, right? Over Yom Hashmini, Yimel is b'sor loso. On the eighth day, you should um, do circumcision. Now let's figure this out. He's born on Tuesday. Born on Tuesday. When is the bris going to be? Next week on Tuesday. Tuesday. Now tell me something. He's born on Tuesday, let's say at noon, okay? Mm -hmm. Wednesday at noon, how old is he? Mm -hmm. One day. Thursday at noon, he's? Mm -hmm. Two days. Friday at noon, he's? Mm -hmm. Shabbos at noon, is. Sunday at noon? Five days. Monday at noon? Six days. Tuesday at noon? Seven days. So how old is, old is he when he gets his bris Seven days. Seven days, not eight days, seven days. <laughs> Why is this like Isn't that terrible? 
<laughs> it really is seven days, right? And I'll tell you something else. I'll tell you something else. When do you become 13 years old or 30 years old? When do you become a certain number of years old? On your birthday. So let's figure it out. You're born on January 24th. Okay, round you go, February, March, December, January, 21, 20, 22, 23. When you get to January 23, right, you're not yet 30 years old. You've got to get to January 24th, the same day on which you were born, because then you've gone through all the days necessary to add another whole year of days. That's true. You become 13, you become responsible for your actions, in this world anyway, on your birthday. Because you're full 13 years old. You've been through 13, you've been through 13 cycles of 365, or roughly in terms of the lunar year. So now let's go back to the to the to Brismila. The Torah says on the eighth day, and it doesn't mean eight days old. So what does it mean? It means he's been alive on eight days. There are eight days in which he had a living presence. So it's not the length of time. It's the days on which he existed. So in a way, the bris mila is really a seven and an eight together. Because how old you are isn't negligible. It isn't negligible. And he really is seven days old. But this is a seven days old that we count as eight because we don't count how old he is. We count on how many days he's been in existence. And that's why it's called Ben Shmonas Yomim. Here the Hebrew is really exquisite. Ben can mean son of or produced by or representing or you know, generated by. He's something that has been produced or generated by eight days, eight separate days that produced him, right? Even though he's only seven days old. So this is seven days old reaching into eight. Now what's going to happen is the Brismila is going to seal the covenant that he has with the Kodesh Baruch Hu. Not that if he had medical problems he wouldn't be part of the covenant. Okay, that's a long story. But that's this is the way it's done. That's what we say, to induct him into the covenant of, uh, of Abraham. So now, that means that this is a seven plus an eight. It's seven days old, plus a presence of eight, and the presence of eight projects into the nature, into the natural, that injection of the supernatural. Uh, if you look at the original Brismila, when it says that Abraham circumcised himself and, his, and Yishmael and all of the members of his household, in one of the psukim, the Torah uses the nif'al, the um, passive voice <coughs> describing what happened to Abraham. He was circumcised. Now, since he did it for himself, and by the way, in the same verse, it says, he and Yishmoel, both of them, use, was circumcised. There's a gigantic difference. Yishmoel was circumcised by Abraham. He was just acted on. Abraham acted so the Rashi comments one way. He says, and he uses the basic idea, he says, Avram took hold of the Orla and he thought, I'm 99 years old. What's going to happen here? And he wasn't prepared to go through with it, so Kodesh Baruch Hu took his hand and pushed him through it, which means he couldn't do the, the Bismillah on his own. He had to also be nif'al. He also had to be acted upon because you can't create this for yourself. So Rashi talked about the, the fact that he was concerned about the actual procedure. Others talk about the fact that you can't make that kind of covenant with the Kodesh Baruch on your own. You can't do it for yourself. So in his case, they had to, had to have that, that feature. <coughs> so this produces a physical change in the body, but the fact that the physical change in the body induces him into a, into a covenant with the Creator, that's an injection of what's beyond seven, what's really eight, into this world. Yeah? I, I'm so confused with that concept because the way that you're saying it makes it seem like he existed a day before he was born. But he, 
that's not, I'm, sure, I'm sure that's not what you're trying to say, so I'm kind of confused. Let's count it again. Let's, let's, let me try to say it again and try to, ma and try to make it clear. Of course, I don't mean the day he existed, but the day he was born. Yeah. <laughs> so let, let's, let's, let, let's take it again. He's born Tuesday at noon. Yeah. Okay. So we agree that next Tuesday at noon, he's seven days old. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now let's count the days on which he was alive. Well, he was alive on the first Tuesday, yeah. and Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday, and Shabbos, and Sunday, and Monday, and Tuesday. So he's been alive on eight days. Although he's not eight days old, he's been alive on eight days. Of course, for the half day at the beginning, half day at the end, but, but he's been alive on eight days. So if I ask, if I ask, for example, which days of the week produced him? In terms of getting to the position of having this circumcision done, it's eight days. Even though it's not eight full days, the number of days is old, it's different. So that, that shows you how the seven and the eight work together. No, I don't know what you mean. Do we not consider the baby to be alive? Yes, that's true. Um, well, in our case, the soul doesn't enter the child until the birth process. So it isn't the person. It's preparing the body that's going to serve the soul together in becoming a person. So that's, that's certainly true in our case. Um, I'm not sure that it's true the same way for non-Jews. And the, the difference is just as you say, is abortion. <clears throat> for them, abortion would be much more serious than it is for us. Um, so that's, I think that's the idea. From our point of view, it's the person's age, not the age of the body that counts. The age of the body is a little bit more so than, than the actual uh, age of the person. Okay, so that's the general idea of seven and eight. Now, this, what I, what I told you at the beginning, is the theme, especially in <sighs> Kabbalistic literature, that you have to distinguish very carefully between what a thing is, on the one hand, and how it interacts with you. We naturally try to make a bridge between those. I see the way something interacts with me, and I draw conclusions about what it is. That may be accurate or inaccurate. You may sometimes you get more uh, information about it, sometimes less. Sometimes you mis misunderstand about the way uh, things interact with you. I uh, don't <coughs> know if you've ever heard the word coolth as parallel to warmth. Look up in a dictionary that has old words. You'll see that uh, the idea was at one time that there's something in warm things that makes them warm, and there's something in cold things that makes them cold. Warmth makes warm things warm, and coolth makes cold things cool. And warmth and coolth were things, and they were there, and they could interact with one another, you could trade one for the other, and so forth and so on. Uh, the idea that heat is an activity, not a thing, but an activity, is roughly random molecular motion uh, that determines heat, was a gigantic change in the conce concept of the, of the phenomenon. So we interact with warm and cool things all the time, and we're good at building machines that that uh, generate both heat and, uh, and cold, but we had drastically wrong understanding of what they were. So if we're trying to take what we interact with and use it as a way of understanding what it is, <coughs> that's very, very dangerous. Now, when it comes to the creator, um, I think that's the key case where we only have interactions that we can describe, and I should say as a footnote, we can describe them because we've been taught how to describe them, not because we investigated it and 
uh, hypothesized and checked or hypothesized by experimentation and so forth and so on, or verified by philosophy, we've been, it's been revealed to us the nature of the interactions that are taking place. But to go beyond that to what the Creator is in and of Himself is something that's beyond our ability to do, both certified by Maimonides and by the Kabbalists, is something that's beyond our ability to do. So there, the, uh, the, to, to talk about a Kodesh Baruch is only to talk about what happens in our world. Now, I want to conclude this discussion by relating it to something where there's, I think, a common tendency to look at things in a certain way, which may be misleading. We contrast appearance and reality. Don't be fooled by appearances. Appearances can lead you astray. You have to look beyond the appearances to register the reality and know that that's what's real, that's what's true, and uh, then deal with the reality as a reality. Don't treat symptoms. Treat the disease. They'll tell you in medicine. Um, I think that although there is some wisdom in those words, there's also a great, a great opportunity for a terrible mistake. Let me give you two examples. Um, <clears throat> suppose you're working in the sacred service and you are assigned to protect the life of the President of the United States. And you happen to know that from time to time he wants to hear the opinions of ordinary Americans, their honest uh, spontaneous opinions. So from time to time, he dresses up in a disguise and he goes strolling on the streets of Washington, D.C. and talks to people. Puts on a bus driver's cap and a false mustache and, you know, walks with a limp and uh, walks out of the building, you know, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? He finds that valuable. Okay, you're off duty. You happen to be on the street in Washington, D.C. Look down the street and you say, aha. I know that shoulder. I know those shoulders. I know that tilt of the head. I recognize the twang in the voice. I know who that is. Should you go up at that moment and say, good evening, Mr. President? I don't think so, because he doesn't want to be known as the president. He wants to be thought of as a common bus driver so he can get honest, spontaneous opinions of Americans. See here, there's an appearance and a reality which one guides your action? Dafka, the appearance, not the reality. He really isn't the bus driver. He's really president of the United States. But you don't react to him that way. There'll be a disaster if you do that. No. You react in terms of the appearance. Now, here's a second example. If you haven't done this, it's worth take, trying. Take a, gl a glass, fill it half with, halfway with water, take a knife and put it in. And the knife has, should be tall enough to, you know, to be out of the water. At most angles, when you look at it, what you'll see is the knife goes this way to the entrance to the water, and then it goes like this and bends down. That's, what, that's the way it looks. Now, somebody hasn't seen this before and looks at it and says, boy, what's wrong with that knife? It's got a bend in the knife. Says, no, 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 it's a refraction of the, of the light coming off the knife through the, through the water, and it's just a visual illusion. Right? Is that really bent? No, it's really, it's straight. Don't worry. Just looks bent. Yeah, just looks bent. Now let's suppose you're standing there looking at the glass and you see the clear appearance of bending. Somebody goes up to you, stands next to you and says, I don't know what you're, what you're talking about. Looks straight to me. He has a problem because, listen carefully, because it really looks bent. That's how it really looks. And if he doesn't see it as bent from the same perspective that I'm standing, got something wrong with his retina, or his optic nerve, or his brain, or his tongue, something's wrong. <laughs> right? Because the appearance is just as real as the independent shape of the knife. The shape of the knife is the shape that it has when no one's looking, and if never one, everyone disappeared, it would still have the same shape. The appearance is how it interacts with me. That doesn't make it less real. It doesn't make it less real. The interaction with me is also real. Now, if, this goes back to what I said now three times, if you take the appearance and use that 
to infer what the reality is, you could make a mistake. That's true. So you should be careful about it. But the reason that we are uh, careful about appearances is not because they're less real. It's just because they are misleading if you try to infer from them what the appearances, what the reality is behind the appearance. And therefore, the Rambam says in the Moran the Volchim, therefore, this is one of the consequences of what he says, that when Moses asked God to be acquainted with God's actions, Rachecha, show me your ways. And, and, and Moses says, and if you do that, ve'edocha, I will know you. So Ramam says, the verse is telling you, the Pasuk is clear, that if you know God's actions, you know him. Do you know him fully, wholly, essentially? No, but you don't have to have all those qualifiers. You're not knowing something else. You are knowing him. Knowing his actions is a way of knowing him. It doesn't give you everything, but it gives you something. It's not a different subject. So when we talk about that which is beyond nature, and talk about relating to it in terms of what it does to nature, or in nature, or in the natural world, that's something that's real. It's real, it's valuable, it's true, and you have to know it, what it does and what it doesn't do. And it may not give you a picture of what's, of what's beyond. This is the idea of eight being seven plus one. Questions? Yeah. Does it say that God will know Moses, or Moses will know God? Moses is making a petition. He's saying to God, please show me your ways, and if you do, I will know you. I will know you. And Moses is talking. Okay, so, yeah. With the appearance of eight nine, you think it appears a certain way? The appearance of trying to go twice? Eight, in, in the, when we're talking about eights in, in the Torah, every eight is a seven plus one. And the reason it's seven plus one is because, and now taking what the Maharal says, that eight means that was beyond nature. It means it's nature plus one, which affects the seven and makes it into something new. And that's the, that's the picture that we're getting. It's not like, you know, it's not like you spent all your time in the prairie, but there's also oceanography. So, oh, wow, oceanography. You know, three quarters of the planet is covered by oceans. Oh, really? I'm missing out on three quarters? Maybe I should spend the time in that. That's not going to help you with prairie dogs. Going to study the sea is not going to help you with prairie dogs. It's a different subject, a different context, a different mode of life, different uh, circumstances. It's a different subject. That's not what we mean when we say eight is supernatural versus seven is natural. Because mm -hmm. eight is seven plus one. It's not something outside. Do we know the exact thing that the eighth nine is doing to the other seven days? I'm sorry? Do we know what the eighth nine is exactly doing to the other seven days? Well, in each case, in each case, it does something else. Uh, I didn't exhaust the subject, but for example, Shmini Atzeres and Shavuos, I said in the name of the Arizal, cement whatever has been... I meant for Hanukkah, sorry. The other example oh. I understand for Hanukkah. Oh, yeah, so, so uh, let's see what the eight does. Well, uh, in this case, it's the seven. Let's see if I can, one second. That's a nice question. Let's put it this way. Um, the number seven here it is the seven out of the eight nights that the, the oil burned. That's true. It burned miraculously. But the number seven is a number of nature. So the number seven here would indicate how you look at the war. If you look at the war as something that's purely natural and, and would, would be able to see it without its being divine providence. <clears throat> here, the seven being the vehicle for a miracle, which is clearly an intervention from above. Um, uh, the way in which you see that the war also was a miracle. And in fact, having said it that way, I think, I haven't said this before, this is a nice question that you're asking, that what you would have to see is that the burning of the oil in the first night 
or the na the natural night was also was also uh, beyond nature. I have to work on this. It's a, it's a nice question. There's a famous Gemara, uh, Rabbi Chinin Mendoza. His daughter set up the Shabbos lamps, and she ignited them. She lit the the wicks, and then she realized that instead of putting oil in the containers, she put in vinegar. Now, Rabbi Mendoza said. He who commanded oil to burn, he will command vinegar to burn. Don't bother arranging something. She'll switch it. She couldn't because she was Mikhail Shabbos already. But you know, don't arrange it. Don't worry about it. It'll burn. But notice how he describes oil burning in exactly the same words as he describes vinegar burning. For him, the oil, I'm quoting Rav Dessa now, the way with him, the oil burning was no different from the vinegar burning. I, this is flammable by chemistry. That's not flammable by chemistry. So what? Chemistry is nothing. Chemistry is nothing. It burns because the Kodesh Baruch Hu commanded it to burn. So you can command this to burn also. That means to say he saw what we normally classify as miracle. We saw that in what we call natural. That's, that's the goal. So I think that would be part of what has to be done here. You'd have to see that just as the extra seven <coughs> days of burning were miraculous. And by the way, this works very well with one of the descriptions of what actually happened. I was talking with my Robertson about this this morning. I realized there's another miracle that nobody talks about. And you didn't see anybody talk about it. If you say that the oil burned more slowly, that's all. This burned more slowly, right? Well, it burned all, more slowly on all eight nights. So the supernatural performance was eight nights long. <coughs> But since you had enough oil for one night's performance, naturally, the net miracle is, is only seven. Right? So now, it means, according to this description of how the miracle took place, one part of the miracle was that in the morning it went out. It naturally stopped burning. And it lighted again the next night. Otherwise, there's still oil there. Why doesn't it keep burning? It didn't all burn up in one night. And the miracle was only that it burned more slowly. So it's got to go out. So I think that's, that's, also, that's also part of the miracle. So it comes out that in the oil itself, there's a seven, <coughs> there's a seven and an eight in the same phenomenon. This is not comes out like Bris Mila. Because on all eight nights, there was a mir miraculous event. But the miracle necessary to make those eight nights' work did, started with a, a basis of one, which would have done it all by itself, so it only added seven. So it's really seven plus one. <laughs> I didn't think of that before. Okay.